this afternoon we're going to start off um, thinking about unwanted immune responses rather than desired, which has been the focus of this morning's talks. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you um, about the issue of um, immunogenicity of biological drugs. Now, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, I mean, essentially, of course, any molecule, any new biological drug, or even um, other proteins, consumer products, uh, even food ingredients can contain immunologically novel protein content that our bodies have not seen to, and therefore can be considered foreign and then react against. Now, that isn't always a problem, of course. That's what we want in the context of pathogens. But from a point of view of developing um, biotherapeutics, this is a big problem and can result in treatment failure. Uh, unfortunately, Getting to the heart of understanding what's driving immunogenicity is very complex. There are many factors that are, that are driving unwanted uh, immune responses. And these can be broadly categorized into two areas, um, extrinsic and intrinsic. Many of these actually overlap with each other as well. So it is a fairly sort of a reductionist view of things, but uh, just to keep things simple. Extrinsic factors are more things that we have less control over, such as how the drug is administered, so its route administration, how often it's given to an individual, the concentration of that drug, um, the patient's own immune system status, for example, are they hyper or hypo-responsive? Um, do they have pre-existing um, antibodies against these molecules or uh, cross-reactive uh, antibodies against these molecules? And also, what's the genetic status of these individuals as well, such as HLA type? Um, intrinsic factors, such as the amino acid sequence of a protein, um, how it's formulated, whether it's aggregated or not, um, even factors relating to code and optimization can have a big, big role to play in ultimately the immune response that's directed towards it. So demonstrating um, in the context of biologic or biotherapeutic de development, demonstrating that your molecule has a reduced immunogenicity um, is really, really critical for both clinical benefits um, and also uh, commercial benefits, because many of your competitors who are developing similar molecules, this is going to be a key differentiating factor. Um, and having low immunogenicity is so important for, for so many reasons that I've just mentioned. Now, unfortunately, just thinking about immunogenicity at the very end stage of your product development is more than likely going to be a very risky strategy, and it's just going to be too late. So managing immunogenicity risk right from the design stage is really essential to make sure that you're making the right decisions as you go forward. So this cartoon really simplifies um, the, some of the key pathways that are driving unwanted uh, immunogenicity. So if we think about biologic, this molecule is, is given to a patient and is taken up and processed and presented by cells of the immune system, such as antigen presenting cells. These can be macrophages, dendritic cells, B cells. Um, and these antigen presenting cells uh, will be presenting peptides that are derived from the biologic in the context of MHC class 2. So this is a, these are uh, exogenous proteins to a classical class II presenting pathway. And MHC uh, peptide complexes on the surface of the APCs are then presenting so CD4 positive helper T cells. And this very specific interaction is what's required to then stimulate the adaptive arm of the immune response. So if the cognate interaction occurs between your helper T cell and the MHC peptide complex, along with the appropriate co-stimulation and other signals, then these CD4 T cells will become activated they'll produce cytokine, they'll proliferate to the, to the dividing, um, and they, that can then go on to drive um, your B cells to become potent plasma secreting plasma cells, so antibodies that are actually going to be directed against the biologic of interest. So generating anti-drug antibody, anti antibodies, as they're known, is not always a problem. It is, of course, if they're uh, neutralizing or if they can affect somehow the, the potency of that molecule. Um, but there are other concerns as well, such as these antibodies could um, obviously alter the PKPD of the drug overall, um, as well as reducing the efficacy of that molecule. It can actually lead to very serious consequences of cross-reactivity against potential endogenous proteins. And that is, can be catastrophic in certain circumstances and has indeed happened. So safety is a main concern uh, in regards to immunogenicity. But of course, you want to have a drug that's actually going to perform appropriately as well in the patient, and it needs to be effective. So thinking about what's driving this, it's really the, the T-cell response, which we're focusing a lot on in our assays at ProMune. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on in our, in our uh, talk today. There are also aspects of the innate immune response, which I will also cover. And these particularly relate to first infusion reactions. And um, that will be covered in, our, uh, in the part of the talk relating to our ProStorm service. So 
Um, at Premium, we have a large uh, PBMC biobank. These are cells that are sourced from the UK NHS Blood and Transplant Service. So these are healthy volunteers that have donated blood. And this blood is available for research use. And we process the blood into PBMCs and we cryopreserve them according to our own SOPs. And each of the individual donors are then HLA typed. So we have a full spectrum of DRDP, DQ, and also MHD class one where, where that's appropriate. And these cells are cryopreserved. And then we can pull them out of the donor bank depending on what we want to, to use them for. And the great thing about it is because we have this HLA genotype information, we can actually select donors to have a broad distribution of different HLA types, or if we want to specifically narrow down on spe some specific genotypes because of a disease association or some other reason, then uh, we, can, we can do that as well. So these cells are then deployed in uh, functional dendritic cell T cell assays and also our antigen presentation assays, which I'm going to talk about next. So the ProPresent antigen presentation assay is, is uh, an assay referred to as MAPS. Sometimes you'll see that in the literature, which stands for MHC Associated Peptide Proteomics, hence the abbreviation. Um, and this is a service uh, and, a, and a, an analytical tool which allows you to identify naturally processed and presented epitopes from your protein of interest. So really, it's a way of looking at how the immune response can visualize your, your drug. Um, so this is particularly appropriate if you're working with, for example, therapeutic antibodies, with replacement factors, but actually is equally appropriate for looking at the impact of protein modifications. So if you want to change an amino acid sequence, you want to, may want to understand whether that's driving altered antigen processing presentation and can actually also be used very effectively in target identification for, for vaccines. So it allows you to look at the entire proteome of an organism, which can obviously be very complex, and get to the heart of exactly what the repertoire of peptides is that's being presented. So Proimmune Service allows us to look at um, either MHC class one or class two, and I'm going to focus here on the uh, class two data to start with. Um, it's a very, very quick approach, it allows us to look at multiple different test articles in just a few weeks. And we have a huge experience of a range of different test articles, including antibodies, blood replacement factors, gene therapy vectors, um, infectious diseases, um, oncolytic viruses, and also food proteins. And so those are all listed um, there on the, on the slide deck. So the principle of the assay is actually relatively simple. What we do is we take a protein or proteins of interest. So it can be a recombinant protein, it can be a crude mix, it can be um, a whole array of different proteins from a, even a bacterial lysate, for, for example. And then we generate monocyte derived dendritic cells from a range of different donors. And the assay is performed donor by donor. So this isn't a pool of DCs, this is actually looking at it donor by donor. And, <clears throat> excuse me. and we know, of course, the HLA type of those donors as well. The dendritic cells are loaded at a specific molar concentration. The DCs are matured. And at that point, they stop taking up the, pro, um, the protein and they'll then uh, process that inside the cell and present peptides on the surface in the context of MHC class 2. At that point, we then perform a lysis step of the dendritic cells and we immunoprecipitate the MHC class 2 molecules on the surface of the cell using an HLA specific antibody. So we have um, antibodies against HLA DR, DP, and DQ. So we can pull these, these different loci down either in series um, or um, one by one, depending on, on what you are specifically looking for. Following the isolation of these MHC peptide complexes, we then do an elution to um, uh, elute the, the peptides from the groove. And then these peptides are then run through sequencing LCM SMS to then identify the in, in exact sequences that are presented in the context of class two. Um, there are a lot of things that kind of go on behind the scenes, of course. This is a very sort of, uh, detailed procedure. Um, and the first thing that we need to do is to generate a, a database which consists of the entire human proteome. And on top of that, we'll add in the sequence or sequences of interest. And then what we report to you are all the peptides from the loaded protein that are being presented on the surface of MHC class two. We're also confirming the maturation, of course, of the dendritic cells, um, of the overall repertoire of peptides, and the identification of housekeeping proteins as well. So um, this is a kind of a typical data set that you might expect to see. Um, each donor um, is listed in the horizontal row. So we have donor three, for example, here, which has the HLA type DRBO401 and 1501, very common class two alleles. This is the specific peptide that's been identified. We then report exactly which sequence, um, which uh, domain that's from and the actual positions of the peptide. And then a, an expect value is assigned to that. And an expect value is uh, essentially a measure of 
peptide identity. So if you have an expect value of less than 0 0.05, you can be sure that that is an absolute hit. And that is exactly the sequence that's been identified. And as you can see, as you would expect for class two, you don't just get a single 15 mer, you can have peptides of a range of lengths ranging from typically 12 to 18 amino acids, sometimes slightly smaller, sometimes slightly longer. And that they're often nested sequences, nested sets. And as you can see, there are many examples of that for uh, a, this particular example as well. You can also identify multiple peptides of exactly the same sequence with different expect values, and that's because they can have unique identifications. So ultimately, the more peptide hits you see is it's not a quantitative measure of how much peptide is identified, but it is a, indeed a, a semi-quantitative measure of the abundance of those individual sequences that are identified in the sample. When we put this information together, and you'll, um, fortunate enough, I think in the, in the next talk, you'll be able to see a little bit more about, about these sorts of data sets. You can identify promiscuously presented sequences, which are maybe presented by a range of donors. And this is important because sometimes promiscuously presented peptides are often associated with a higher risk of immunogenicity, because you, you're talking about a common presentation pattern um, associated with maybe a broad range of different HLA types. Now, it's important to point out that just because a peptide is being presented in this assay doesn't mean to say that it's a functionally relevant sequence. Um, that, that's an, another question that has to be addressed through functional T-cell assays, such as the ProMAP T-cell assay, which I'll talk about in a moment. Very briefly, to give you an idea of an example of the ProPresent data, I'm going to take you through a case study looking at Vitreptococ alpha, which is an engineered factor, factor 7A analogue. A native factor 7A has been used for many, many years with no problems. And Nova Nordisk decided to engineer a sequence variant of this with three amino acid substitutions to increase the enzymat enzymatic activity of the drug to make it more fast acting. So um, unfortunately, well, there were nothing, nothing was observed in phase one, two trials, but when it got to phase three, some bleeding episodes were observed in these patients. Um, and these were effectively treated, but after that, some anti-drug antibody inhibitors were observed in some of these patients. And so the late stage drug development was immediately halted. And the question was asked, how can we ensure that we don't engineer in any unwanted epitopes in the future? So an, um, a paper was published from Nova Nordisk by Casper Lamberth in conjunction with the FDA, which was looking at uh, fact, this particular question. And it's a great paper because it uses many different approaches. And this is just one example of the data using a MAPS assay, comparing data uh, generated in-house at Nova Nordisk and uh, also at ProImmune. And what you can see, uh, the take home message, is that the N-terminal sequence here, the valine um, at position 158 that was mutated to D, this uh, position didn't result in any antigen processing and presentation. But the two C-terminal mutations at position 296 and 298, you can see actually resulted in a, in a lot of antigen processing and presentation in the donors that were looked at. These were completely independent donors um, from Novo and ProImmune studies, completely unique donors. Um, and so this is just really to demonstrate the promiscuity of presentation of this particular region. Now that's obviously pretty unfortunate, but when you go on and actually look at the fact that these sequences drove a functional T cell response using T cell proliferation assays, we can see here on the left hand um, uh, side of this uh, plot that the, the 158 mutation, there was no difference in T cell response compared to wild type and mutant. But when we look at either the individual mutations or the mutations combined, the mutants um, gave a, a really significantly enhanced um, T cell response uh, in, in T cell proliferation assays. So the conclusion for this was that um, immunogenicity was the root cause of the failure of this drug. And out of these mutations, two out of three of them were presented by DR. And additional studies in the paper showed that this was, was really quite high affinity. And as, I, as I've just shown you, resulted in T cell activation. Um, so stratification of patient data by HLA type is also really important when evaluating immunogenicity of sequence modified drugs. And in this case, the results of a range of different assessment tools did really reflect clinical outcomes. So this approach has been used many times now. Um, this is a talk given by uh, Jad Mamri from Merck looking at ipilimumab and nivolumab, obviously very well-known uh, cancer uh, therapeutic antibodies. And so I'd, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about that, I would direct you to our YouTube channel to have a look at some of those talks. Um, so the functional validation of these epitopes is really important. And to do that, we perform our CFSC T-cell proliferation assay, which is a flow cytometry-based method typically looking at a range of 40 or even 50 donors, um, where we take PBMCs, um, which are CD8 depleted, when we're looking at this particular question, and we generate 
peptides that are either overlapping from the sequence modifications of interest, or if we've identified these peptides by pro, um, pro present, then we will actually just look at those unique sequences and stimulate them in a seven day proliferation assay uh, and then perform flow cytometry to characterize the proliferation that's occurred. And as you can see from the overlapping peptides, the, um, if there's any stimulation that's occurring in these PBMCs, then the fluorescent dye that's labeled uh, in these cells will become divided equally between the daughter cells. And then this can then be analyzed by flow cytometry. So the interesting population is this upper left quadrant, which is CFSE low and CD4 high. So by flow, we can actually see that in an unstimulated control, there's just a, a small number of these cells, just natural turnover in the course of the seven days. But at the end of the seven days, we can see the proliferating population here. So every peptide is performed um, and analyzed in six replicates against each of the donors. So you can imagine there's an awful lot of uh, analysis that goes on. We perform a number of controls, which is PBS, um, sorry, an unstimulated control is our, is our background. And then positive controls are tuberculin PPD, um, keyhole, keyhole input hemocyanin. So these are two protein controls that drive a memory and a naive response respectively. And then we also have a peptide, two peptide pools. One is CEFT, which is CMV, EBV, flu, and tetanus peptide pools. And then we also have a KLH peptide pool. And these are um, a set of peptides that have been identified as being naturally processed and presented from KLH using the ProPresent MAPS um, assay. So this is, uh, again, drives a naive response. And what you can see across the board is that every color is a specific donor. And there are certain peptides which would are driving responses in individual donors. And typically, if you see a response of three or more um, uh, donors in, in your cohort, then you, it's something which needs to be uh, looked at in more detail in respect to a potential unwanted T-cell response. If you're looking at overlapping sequences, you often see a peak of response um, as you're walking along the peptide sequence, the protein sequence. Um, this has been applied um, to, to great effect in many different circumstances. This is some data from our last Mastering Immunity meeting presented by uh, Tim Hickling, who's now the head of immunosafety at Roche. But uh, this is actually data from when Tim was based in Pfizer. And you can see here that uh, well, the Pfizer approach uses a, an in silico pre-screening strategy to identify any sequences that may be at sort of low or high risk. And if they're really at high risk, then they're actually deselected at that stage. But then the low risk sequences are taken forward. And what you can see is for all these different sequences, um, the percentage antigenicity shown in the right hand plot uh, in green, these are donors that only zero um, or one donors are responding to and therefore is very, very low risk. Um, however, a, an example of where you have a higher risk is shown above that. And this is some um, sequence variants that they looked at in the CDR uh, uh, light chain too. And the, the sequence variants can be obviously quite small, but can have a significant impact on T cell antigenicity. So the bottom sequence here, there are no donors responding right up to the top sequence here, half of all donors are responding, which is quite unusual to sort of see that. Um, and this is a way that you can then deselect uh, sequences that are, are a higher risk. Um, sometimes the in silico tools don't always um, come up trumps. And interestingly, these are um, some sequences that, that were run in in silico, and they um, identified some potential epitopes. But actually what happens is that when you look at the reality of this, um, both in uh, antigen presentation assays and T cell proliferation assays, sometimes, um, you know, there, there, there's over prediction, of course. And the benefit of actually running these sorts of assays is that you can really understand what the, the problem sequences actually are. And in this case, you can see that there's one sequence that gave a response rate of 21% in, the, in those donors. So again, these talks are all available on our YouTube channel if you want to, want to see more. Um, following on from this, whether or not you're interested in whole um, individual epitope changes in your protein, or maybe you've just got a number of different proteins that you want to characterize, then this, uh, in that second example, this is where the ProCERN dendritic cell T cell assays come into their own. This is a whole protein comparative analysis tool. It's very similar to what I previously just described for the T cell proliferation assay, except in this case, we're using dendritic cells to do the natural antigen processing and presentation. So the first case, uh, the, the first point to say is that the dendritic cells are generated from culture, so monocyte drive DCs. Uh, the proteins provided by our clients are then loaded to, into the cells at a fixed molar concentration. Those DCs are then matured. And at that point, um, there's a wash step, and then they're co-cultured with CFSE labeled uh, PBMCs. And we then measure after seven days of proliferation, the, um, the, the T cells by flow cytometry. 
Um, what you can see here is the benefit of this is to be able to kind of rank your proteins against one another. So if you have a number of different candidates, it allows you to sort of look at which sequences are potentially a higher risk than others. It's also important to bear in mind that um, a specific um, response index here, which is measured by the proportion of donors responding, multiply the strength of those responses, is, is a very useful tool. It's not an absolute figure because um, obviously there are, there are many other sort of factors that can contribute to um, T cell antigenicity. And I think it's also important to bear in mind that this is really looking at T cell antigenicity, not the clinical immunogenicity. T cell antigenicity is really an important driving factor. And this is what this assay can tell you but it's not gonna tell you about all those other factors that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, which can contribute. So each assay has a place and each assay has a great benefit of being able to compare different aspects and to address very specific questions. And this question is great at looking at the overall T cell antigenicity of your, of your proteins. It can also be very useful for looking at the impact of host cell protein contamination as well. Um, and we know that as you increase the concentration, of course, of things like endotoxin, that's also going to have a significant impact, as well as things like host cell protein uh, as well. So to finish off, um, I also just wanted to um, highlight the question of cytokine storm. So first infusion reactions that, that can occur in response to delivering biotherapeutics can occur very, very rapidly. Um, and these are um, symptoms that range from mild to fatal. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing this because I know um, in two talks we've got Jeff speaking and he's going to do a far better job than I in introducing the topic of cytokine storm and he's got some great things to show you. So um, I won't go and spend too much time in the background of this but the key thing to point out is that understanding um, risks of inducing cytokine storm uh, is really, really important from a safety perspective before you get into the first in human studies. And it's almost imperative with any molecule that's going to be um, interacting or affecting the immune system in some way, you really need to understand what the risks are of inducing these innate immune responses. Um, the uh, FDA guidance is very clear on this as well. And um, back in February last year, um, in respect to the latest guidance, which is the non-clinical safety evaluation of immunotoxic potential of drugs and biologics. Um, the FDA expects responses to provide in vitro assays of ligand receptor interactions in human cells, and that an assessment of the potential for cytokine release syndrome caused by therapeutic proteins using unstimulated human cells in both plate-bound and soluble formats with appropriate positive and negative controls, and these assays are considered critical for hazard identification. Um, and in the guidance that's a little bit older from um, August 2014, um, that states that data from animal studies should be supplemented by in vitro assessment of cellular activation, including proliferation and cytokine release in human whole blood or PBMCs, and that a measurement of a cytokine panel should be as broad as possible, including IL-6, interferon gamma and TNF-alpha. So the format of our ProStorm assay is a little bit different to what I was just talking about with the other format assays. This is using unmanipulated and undiluted fresh whole blood. So this is as close as you can get to a clinical, measuring a clinical response without actually doing a clinical study. So in this case, what we typically do is we um, uh, recruit 20 to 30 donors for the study. The donors um, uh, give consent and we draw up to 50 mils of blood into sodium heparin tubes. That blood is then taken straight up into the lab. So within a couple of hours, it's actually being incubated with your test articles. And we then do a 24 hour incubation with the test articles at a range of concentrations. And then we harvest the plasma and then measure the cytokines that are produced in conjunction with that using against the standard curve. So the data I'm gonna show you here is just an example to show you that we have an assay negative control, which is PBS. We have a positive control which is SEB. Um, and then we can also include some comparator molecules such as cetuximab as a, as a low response comparator and alumtuzumab as a high response comparator. And then, as I mentioned, we look at a whole range of different cytokines that are um, requested to be looked at. The most important markers here are really, um, I would say, uh, IL-6 and IL-8 um, and also interferon gamma, TNF-alpha. But IL-10 IL um, and IL-4 are usually very, very low. We also have the option to include additional cytokines as required. So what you can see is that the baseline samples are, are the, the negative control PBS is all in the baseline. The red um, line there is just the median value for each of the different samples with staphylococcal enterotoxin B being our positive control 
And what you can see if I just sort of highlight this high response is that when you aggregate a protein, this is looking at Remicade, as you aggregate it, you get a very sort of significantly high response. If you look at our high response comparator, CAMPATH, as you increase the concentration, you get a nice sort of dose response, which again is something that we, that we typically see. Um, and the benefit of this data is that you can really look at individual donors to see how they respond, um, what the effect is of different formulations, what the, um, the dosing of the drug might be in the context of blood, looking at um, things like CMAX, so actually exposure levels of your drug in, 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 that you're planning to put into patients to see what the actual direct effect is on the, some of these innate rapid cytokine productions which will occur within 24 hours. So overall, um, it's a cytokine release assay to identify specific hazards uh, in regards to cytokine storm. And there is certainly correlation between, between a clinically observed response and the measurements that we see in ProStorm. And it's a very flexible assay design. We can look at both soluble and plate-based formats. Um, we've looked at a whole range of different types of entity. It doesn't just have to be antibody therapeutics. It can also be all sorts of different molecules as well, including generic peptides. And um, the project delivery is really second to none. So we can turn this around, including all the donor recruitment in just four weeks. So it's very, very quick. Um, so hopefully I've demonstrated that managing, thinking about drug immunogenicity from the earliest stage in your project management is really important from a clinical um, safety perspective and also from a commercial perspective. Generating this key data allows you to differentiate your molecule from the competition. And that you, to do this, you need a wide range of different specialist assays. And with Promune's experience in, in doing this and integrating the different tools that we have available, we can really uh, save you time, uh, money, and reducing your program risk. And as I've already mentioned, we, we've got experience in such a wide range of different um, types of entity that uh, hopefully we'll be able to um, help you in your own projects. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions if there's a, a second or two. Thanks, Jeremy, for the great presentation. And I think it's going to be a very good complimentary for the next talk that is going to be by Dr. Zutung Sona. So is, are there any questions right now? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Can I ask a question? Hi, Zubin. Yes, can I? Okay. Yeah, so um, um, my, my question was just that, you know, it's about the MAPS and the follow-up proliferation assay. And, you know, as we all know, it's often difficult to get, you know, both are MHC restricted to some extent, and it's not always possible to get the same uh, cohort of donors for each. So yeah. in terms of the analysis, if you have, you know, what's, what's the best way to analyze the two data sets if you have, you know, two different cohorts for each of the assays? Yeah, thank you, Zeevan, for a great question. So the biggest challenge probably is that in the MAPS assay, it is a very cell intensive assay that does need uh, to use up pretty much most of the cells that are actually available. Um, and so that's one of the challenges because there just remain to be very few cells available left. But there are circumstances where we have kind of high yielding donors and we do have enough cells to then follow on with a T cell proliferation assay. But I'd say that the best strategy of looking at this is probably just numbers to be able to do um, you know, a decent number of donors in the MAPS assay to kind of really get a view of what the overall presentation profile is, and then to be able to test that in a large number of donors in the T cell proliferation assay as well. And I think that's what people like um, Bernard um, Mayer have, have uh, shown as well in France, with looking at some of those sorts of follow ups, looking at both um, healthy and patient samples from uh, his autoimmune cohorts, where they've been able to sort of track those immune responses in patients. So I think. Um, just larger data sets is probably the kind of the way to go there. And as you know, time progresses and as costs come down, that's probably going to become a little bit more of an easier strategy. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.